Well, hey, everybody. Um, I wonder if all of you were with me in July when we talked about addressing. Can you guys drop like a yes or a, or a no? Okay. Wow. So we have a good mix. We have a good mix. Well, if you've never been to one of my webinars before, um, I can't say you're in for a treat, I, you know, <laughs> but um, I, I do try to make things fun. Okay. And basically, let me introduce myself. Okay. Cause that's kind of like the point. <laughs> um, so I'm Annie and I've been with Datamark for several years now. I spent 15 years in local government. A large part of that was um, address management. Okay. I have a GS background. Um, I am basically a client success manager for Datamark. I was on the project execution team for a very long time. Um, and I still execute project work, but I just, I also manage, um, different clients and, you know, work with them and everything to make sure that, um, that they're satisfied. And we really focus on, um, on client success on my team, but I run, um, the strategic planning services, uh, for Datamark as well as our boundary facilitation services. So I'm still very much involved in both of those services. Um, so yeah, I mean, I, I have a GS background, a local government background. So, um, you know, I really enjoy doing these webinars because I feel like I have a unique perspective. Um, and I know that a lot of us, um, especially if we are addressing authorities, um, we have a particular set of struggles uh, that we go through. Um, so uh, I'm very happy to be here today. I'm happy that you're here with me um, because you could have been doing something fun this afternoon, but you're here with me learning about sub addressing. So thank you for that. So Stephanie, um, let's, should we do our first poll? Let's go ahead and do the poll. I, because I, I, need, I need to know like exactly what kind of audience I have. And also this is gonna help you understand a little bit about me too. Okay, so let's go ahead and launch our first poll. Can you do that, Steph? I'm launching it right now. Okay, this is very important. <laughs> What is the worst fall candy? We all know Halloween's Take your time. Up. It's about to be candy yeah. season. You know, uh, maybe maybe you rock with Halloween, maybe you don't. That's fine. But candy corn is like ubiquitous, right? Like I saw it, I saw it in August, which was pretty <laughs> good. Um because that means that fall is coming, which is my favorite season. So I eat two a year. True story. It's been this way ever since I was a kid. Okay. And what, this is like the most embarrassing thing. And I'm essentially telling the world, which is fine. Um, because this is, this is us now. We, this is, we're family now. Okay. When you know this story, I eat two a year. I put them on my teeth and I pretend like I'm a vampire for like five seconds. And then I eat them. And look, I don't make the rules. It's just been that way ever since I was a kid. I eat two a year and I'm good. Okay. That's two too many a year. All right. All right. So we're um, going to, you want to end this poll and we can start the next poll. Yes, let's start the next poll because and I have another, another, we'll yes, I have another story. I promise we'll get into like real talk here soon, but this is very important because I need to know who my enemies are and who I need to remember in prayer later. Just so you guys can see the polling <laughs> results, um, mm. we do have an all of the above 84%. So thank you guys. <laughs> all right. <laughs> That's time awesome. for the next poll. All right, let's launch the next one. All right, we have poll two coming up. Yes. So which is the best seasonal Reese's, okay? And if you say they taste the same, then please just log off. It's fine. <laughs> so I have a funny story and this is, so, okay. I also am a baker and lately, um, I found that I have to go to multiple stores to find the things that I need. Okay. Because I understand that there are shortages and, you know, God bless the people working in the stores. I understand it's, it's horrible right now for a lot of folks. Okay. But I find myself going to different stores for a lot of things sometimes. And one day I passed this end cap and they had Reese's footballs. Okay. Now, you know, I thought, okay, well, a girl hasn't tried this shape. <laughs> So I need to try the Reese's footballs. And on the front of the wrapper, it showed an actual football 
like Reese's puff, okay, with tapered ends and like the chocolate was cut out for like the stitching, the sh like it showed the peanut butter through the stitching or whatever. And I opened it in the car, you know, cause I needed a little energy boost for my next, my next grocery store trip as I'm hopping around trying to find stuff. And y'all, it was the, it was the Easter egg. Like they tried it, they tried it, but it was the Easter egg. It was just the Easter egg repackaged into this football wrapper. And I'm like, y'all didn't even try. Like there's not even any pointy end on either side. Yeah, it was funny. I hope someone's laughing at this um, because yeah, that's, Reese's anything would be great right now. Yeah, any shape, yeah. If you guys know, um, if you guys know anybody who works at Reese's, maybe the research and development, um, if you could just let them know that that we're on to them. Yes, and Autumn. Hey, Autumn. <laughs> it's good to see you. Yes. <laughs> I wish I could be that lazy with my GIS data. Yeah, y'all. I mean, it couldn't have been. It couldn't have been more of an Easter egg, packaged up as a football. I don't know. This is the best class ever. Well, look, okay, you guys sign. I mean, I, so I used to teach a college class. I used to teach a GIS college class, okay? And like the most boring topics for GIS people are, now we're not even gonna talk about development, okay? Because development, that's next level, okay? But the most boring topics I feel like as somebody who's been in GIS for a really long time are coordinate systems and metadata. They are like the worst things to teach. They're, they're like the most boring things to like learn about. It's just overall, just two annoying, boring topics. See, are you, I could tell who the GIS people are. Um, hey Tess, but yeah, I'm, I mean, so sub addressing, I'm like, ugh, ooh, okay. So let's try to make this fun, okay? So I'm, I'm trying to make this fun. We do try to have fun in these and it is, you know, it is kind of like spooky season, even though, even if you guys don't, you know, observe whatever it's at least we have candy right so we can find some good some good things here. So thank you guys for participating in the poll. I know I know who my friends are. So it looks like okay you guys came in clutch Easter egg. Yes, mm -hmm. exactly. I mean exactly. I don't know Easter is my favorite, but I, it's the egg for me. I don't know. I, I don't know why it, it just is. And anybody who says it's not, you guys are lying to yourselves. <laughs> yeah, hit, hit me up in Easter and let me know. <laughs> Follow-up follow webinar. All right. So today um, we are going to talk about some work-related things, but thank you for, um, for participating in our goofy polls. Thank you for um, putting up with us. So we are going to talk a little bit about sub-addressing because that's why we're here today. So that includes like the challenges, the mitigating the risks that are involved with um, sub-addressing, uh, the placement um, and the attribution, because remember we are also um, talking about the GIS part of this, okay? And so remember that GIS is kind of this marriage of um, geography and information. And it's really important to have the geography, but the geography is, is only half of that, okay? You need to have the attribution um, as well. And then some next steps if you guys are considering refining or completing your um, sub addressing information even further. So what are sub addresses? Basically, and this is the only time I'm gonna like read off the slide because what an awkward definition, element of addresses that identify specific locations within structures. Okay, so basically what we're doing is we're taking a structure that has other locations within it and we're differentiating them from each other. Okay, apartment building, for example. Uh, we can use sub addresses to reflect common names. And um, a lot of things that we're talking about in this webinar are, are gonna be in light of the NINA data model, which for those of you who are not familiar, the NINA data model is the National Emergency Number Association, that's NINA. And they have um, produced, developed a data model that is conducive to um, basically public safety GIS. Okay, and, 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 and laying out a schema. I mean, when we say schema, we're talking about like the structure of the data, like what, what the fields should look like, how the information should be laid out within the attribute table, okay? Um, and the, the NINA data model does allow for sub-addressing down to the suite level. And we're gonna talk about what that means here in a little while. So here's some examples. Now I wanna preface this conversation by saying that, um, <laughs> there are, there's definitely more than one way to do addressing, okay? And that goes for sub-addressing and your primaries, okay? And I, 
I can, we can have a conversation about like good, better, best, which is kind of like what we did in July. I don't know if you guys remember, um, but these are just examples. Okay. And, and ultimately, you know, we can talk through this stuff, but a lot of things are, are really going to be based on your local. You always want to default to your local ordinances and SOPs and guidelines um, because that should that should be like the overriding authority for all of this stuff. Now, if you're experiencing a lot of problems in your community and this is something that you're looking at revisiting, um, then I highly recommend that, okay? With, with this particular topic, with, with addressing and NG911, we're not asking you to reinvent your addressing, we're just asking you to revisit it. That's, that's all, okay? So I wanted to show you guys some examples of of structures that may qualify for sub addressing. Now, in your community, you might say, well, we would just give that primaries, that's fine. You can do that. Um, but like I said, we have to be mindful that everyone is doing things differently, okay? So when I wanna sing, this is how we do it, Montel Jordan, I'm not gonna do that because I've already been awkward enough with my candy corn vampire teeth, but I'll say like, this is how we can do it, okay? So, um, some examples of, of structures that could be sub-addressed, so schools. Um, we all know that schools have a lot of different buildings, um, ball fields, et cetera. So schools could qualify for sub-addressing. They could also qualify for primaries as well. Um, anything that's on a complex or campus like hospital. Um, hospitals have um, sometimes large campuses, sometimes they're spread across um, a very large area, but often with hospitals, there are multiple buildings involved. Um, nursing homes or group residential facilities, apartments and condos. And the reason why there's an asterisk next to this one is because um, often, you know, people may just take part of their house and decide to make it an Airbnb or, um, you know, they'll have an in-law suite or um, our friends in California call them ADUs, um, accessory dwelling units, so forth. Um, so, you know, you may choose to have an apartment attached. Um, where I'm here, where, where I am here in Virginia, it's very common for people to buy like a large property and they want to build a home, but they may start with like a garage that's got an apartment over top of it. Okay. And so when they move in, um, you know, obviously the garage will have an address because there's an apartment there and then they, they will stay there while they build the primary and then they'll move that address and then assign a sub off of that. So there's lots of different scenarios with um, residential. Okay. Uh, mobile home parks mobile home parks are a biggie, potential candidate for sub-addressing also for primaries. Um, recreational parks or areas, okay? Like in my park, we have, of course, the, um, the shelters where people meet for, you know, family reunions and parties and so forth. We have a, a BMX trail, um, lots of different areas and parks that could be, you know, ball fields um, that could be addressed. Um, industrial and business complexes, um, obviously shopping centers are big candidates for sub addressing. Um, oftentimes it's easier to go with subs with um, shopping centers because sometimes um, there's a lot of like splitting apart of, of different spaces and merging together depending on the businesses that come and go. Uh, farms, um, rehabilitation facilities, daycare centers, storage units, you guys know. You guys know um, that, that there are a lot of different um, structures out there. And, and this is not a complete list by any means. I'm sure that there are some on here that I missed, but these are just kind of like the biggies, right? So let's talk about the challenges with sub-addressing. Um, number one, for the addressing authority, a lot of times it can be inconsistent. Are we using letters this week? Are we using numbers? Um, are we taking guidance from the post office? Like, <laughs> what, how are we doing this? And you know how how are we managing this information? You know, I told you guys in the very beginning that I'm involved in in the strategic planning process for DataMark, and I talk with a lot of addressing authorities. And often, what I find is that the actual addressing responsibilities are spread over the counties, right? So, like, you might have one department over here that handles giving the primary, or one department handles subdivisions but another department actually assigns the sub addressing and there doesn't end up being communication between the two. So if you can imagine how, how difficult that can get for an addressing authority, right? Some people just don't have any type of, of understanding about what sub addresses there are within their locality. 
okay? Another challenge is availability of addresses, okay? I don't like to, to draw hard lines when it comes to addressing. Like I know a lot of people are like, never assign half addresses. Well, guys, where I live, my town, like our downtown area, I mean, it's almost 300 years old. Like we're running out of addresses. And so we have to use half addresses. Like it's not something that we enjoy. Um, but that's that's kind of a necessity, right? So so a lot of these things that we do that are kind of unorthodox or undesirable are kind of born out of necessity. Um, how do we maintain this information? Um, or do you have people that are just making up their own? That was a big problem too. You know, if they move mom in, well, you know, mom, we don't want mom, you know, using our address, you know, we'll just give her a separate address. We'll put a separate mailbox out at the end of the road. And she just kind of makes up her own address. That's very common too. But how do you keep track of that? Um, your ordinances. Some of you have them, some of you don't. Um, but a lot of times they are lacking information specifically about sub addressing. And a lot of this is because they're kind of older. Um, a lot of our ordinances were written in the late 80s, early 90s, and they're just kind of bare bones, right? Um, so again, you know, it might be time to revisit that for a lot of you. And here's kind of like the big question. Well, does it need a sub address or does it need an individual um, or primary? So we can use those two terms in, uh, interchangeably. So what, what would be the best fit for the situation? Um, and then finally, the workflow and communication. What does that look like? You know, of course your ordinance is gonna have those things that are documented in your code, um, but your SOPs are gonna have that workflow and what that's supposed to look like, okay, on the back end. Uh, from the GIS perspective, we definitely experienced some challenges like what, how do we place these sub addresses, right? Like how do we um, show those in GIS? So do we stack them all on the structure? What if we don't have any idea about the structure? Like what if we don't have building footprints or we don't have aerial imagery? And I know a lot of you GIS people are like, well, just use the aerial base imagery in Esri. Okay, but what about people who aren't Esri clients? You know what I'm saying? Like not everyone has the same amount of resources. So we have to be very mindful about that. Um, also managing the level of detail. Remember that GIS is a marriage of geography and information. So you have to have both. Okay, so what information are we gonna include about these sub addresses? All right. And then of course, there's the ever present data quality issues um, that we have to talk about. So, you know, how can we make sure that, that you know, we're, we're QCing our data and, you know, how does the sub addressing fit into that in the scheme of things? And Steph, I can't, I can't see the chat without popping it open. So I don't know if there are questions. So we'll just kind of get to that, I guess, as we can. Um, so from the public safety perspective, um, sub-addressing presents a lot of challenges, especially if none exists. Um, so it can cause issues with resource routing. Um, if you have one address assigned to a property that's got like eight buildings and nothing is signed, you know, you may end up in a situation where people are going from building to building trying to locate an emergency, which obviously in public safety, um, seconds, you know, our, our lives, basically. Um, and then we get into dealing with um, forcing addresses in CAD. And for the GIS folks, when we're talking about CAD from a public safety perspective, we're not talking about AutoCAD, we're talking about computer aided dispatch. So that's a public safety thing, not like an engineering AutoCAD type thing. Um, but forcing addresses is something that is inconvenient because number one, it means that the address is not is not in the CAD system. So there's something going on. It's missing information. Um, it also takes time to do that. Okay, so that's another kind of like taxation on the time. Um, so I will open this up for just a few things. So what are some challenges that you guys have experienced either with handling multiple structures on a property or sub addressing situations? Have you guys experienced any issues and you want to share those in the chat? So in the chat, we have building effective locators, um, large poultry operations. Mm -hmm. Can see where poultry houses would be useful. We have a question up here. Not confident in signing sub addresses. Yeah. Number has been posted wrong 
are yeah. posted on wrong frontage yeah. um, with the standard units versus suites mm -hmm. and to use or not. Yeah, that's very common. Okay, all right. Wow, you guys yeah, are we have, <laughs> so you guys are going crazy. Okay, <laughs> so I can't even read these. They're coming in so fast. Um, populated unit data does not match signage. Okay. Subdividing shopping centers. Yeah. Assessor's office uses stacked parcels for many of the sub addressing mm -hmm. situations. So placing address points on top of these parcels results in points overlapping with parcels. They don't actually match. Inconsistent sub addresses and different sources like one versus a. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Well, so it's safe to say that you guys have definitely had your fair share of challenges. Yes, <laughs> it kind of would seem that way, um, but you're not alone. Okay, so let me show you a very specific example. And this is like, this is a real life thing that, that, I, that I uncovered while doing a strategic plan for um, one of our clients. Okay, all of the names have been changed to protect the innocent, but Basically, with the strategic planning process, we interview um, several stakeholders. So it's 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 generally like the three big ones. So it's the it's the addressing authority, GIS, and public safety. Okay, and they may be one and the same. That's fine. Um, but we interview them, and we you know we gather information about how they do business, and also talk about what we call pain points. Okay, or what's you know what are your what's your problem basically. What are your issues? All right. And, and if you guys have been with me, if I've done your plan, you know this. I I I love and irritate all of my clients because I, I question them about everything. Um, and it ends up, it ends up being for your own good, right? Like we have to get into the minutiae. So one of the things that um that we learned from our public safety um client is that there is a college um and their CAD system could not accept additional information about buildings, but there was this college campus and all of, all of the buildings were using one address, okay? So there were like 60 buildings maybe that were using the same address. Um, what would end up happening is that if there was an emergency on campus, they would call 911 obviously, and sometimes they would have volunteer firefighters come out or volunteer whoever. And often because every building uses the same address, they would carry a paper map into the field with them. Okay. And the paper map had like building names on it, but you know, you have to understand people who dial 911 oftentimes are very frantic. Okay. And sometimes they may not know where they are. You know, it's hard enough just getting a number out of them. Now, can you imagine if someone were visiting, like maybe there was another college student visiting this campus and they didn't know where they were, maybe they had a few drinks, I don't know, but there are a lot of different things that can lead to frantic 911 calls, okay? And so with this particular client, the struggle was, you know, they have volunteer staff respond in the field, but then they'd have to call back into the PSAP to get, to get the specific and precise emergency information, like where is it? And so this is a really big pain point um, because their CAD system, again, computer aided dispatch, was not able to accept um, location information beyond just a simple address, okay? Um, so this is something that we're working through with them, but this is a real life example of, of like a real, a very serious issue um, when you have multiple buildings sharing one and there is no sub addressing, okay? So I just wanted to share that because like I said, it is real life and I'm gonna pull up the chat because I, I see some things coming in. Um, <clears throat> yeah, munis. So I'll tell you guys, um, the two, and I've been doing strategic planning now for almost three years. The two most mismanaged parts of addressing. Number one, when you are a county and you have municipalities who are their own addressing authorities. And I'm not telling you that that's a bad thing. The bad thing is if there's no communication. If they're not communicating that information to you, that's really bad. And the reason why it's bad is because, well, you, you have to go back to like NG911, like 101. And the fact that, remember, as GIS professionals, our jobs are basically transitioning to geospatial first responders. Okay. 
So, um, you know, our GIS data is being asked to do something with a level of accuracy and completeness that it's never had to have before. Okay. Um, and that includes address information. That includes like our call routing boundaries. There's a lot that goes into NG911. I know that this is not the purpose of this webinar, but you know, a lot of you might be, especially if you don't have a public safety background and you're kind of new to this whole thing, well, why is this a big deal? Um, and that's the reason why. Okay. And, and I have, you know, a lot of resources out there. If you guys want to talk through this, um, you know, just, just email me um, or give me a call. But yeah, real life example. Okay. So we're working with this client, just so you know, we're working with them to kind of resolve this and guide this process. Okay. So how do we resolve these issues? Hang on, y'all. Need some back up seat. How do we resolve these issues? Well, we kind of talked in July about how NG911 is changing the way that we do business, okay? And I'm not saying, like I said, we don't have to reinvent, we're just revisiting, okay? And I would say the first thing is to start having these conversations because this is kind of like what gets the momentum going. All right, so NG911 expands our list of stakeholders that are at the table. All right, so we're going above and beyond just the usual public safety people. All right, we're, we're also including our addressing authorities, um, maybe it's the planning department or utilities, whoever's assigning addresses in your locality, um, GIS. Um, sometimes that involves the property owners and other agencies like um, USPS, um, the tax assessor, wh whoever is involved in that addressing process. Okay, so we have to get everybody together. Even if your state or your community or your whatever has not started having discussions about NG911, maybe they've made no progress, maybe they don't even know what that is, you still need to start having these conversations because it's, it's coming whether, whether the, the entities have had the conversations or not um, or whether they're ready to proceed with getting ready for NG911. And I think I told you guys this in July that um, the, the biggest and heaviest lift in any NG911 deployment is not in the hardware software call taking equipment. It's always in the GIS data, okay? And remember that that's because of the business need of GIS. So like our, our GIS data is always gonna reflect the business need, okay? And most of us, because NG911 is new, we haven't had to maintain this level of accuracy and completeness before, okay? Um, maybe it's been maintained by another agency who just cares about, you know, one address. So if there's a good chance that you might be missing a lot of sub-address information, okay? Or maybe it exists in another database. Maybe it exists in an assessor database. And do you guys have access to that? Or maybe you guys have it in, in your utilities department because people, you know, are turning on utilities and stuff as they move in. So, you know, these are the kind of conversations that you need to have because all of this is relevant information, whether the data is spatial or not, okay? I see some more things coming in. Okay, good, you guys are talking among yourselves. That's awesome. I wish I could read all these, but I wanna make sure we get through all of this. Um, so here are, here are some additional tips and tricks, okay? Um, I highly recommend, and again, this is just a recommendation. I'm not telling you you have to do this, okay? I highly recommend that you have one addressing authority in your county, one designated agent for all addresses, okay? Don't have like, don't have like your, your, your subdivisions being addressed by this agency and your you know, commercial sites by this one, and then your sub addresses by this one. Have everything funneled into one, one agency that is educated on assigning addresses for public safety, because addressing is for public safety, okay? Um, visit your ordinances for direction. It's like I said, a lot of you, you may not even know if you have them or where they are. Maybe they're on papyrus paper, like filed away in some filing cabinet or some attic, there's dust on it, there's cobwebs, I don't know, use your imagination. You know where these ordinances are or not, but you wanna consult them for direction if you know what where they are, okay? Um, this will give you some guidance about whether or not a particular location qualifies for individual addresses versus sub addresses, okay? And it can also give you um, guidance about signing or signage. And 
if you don't have this information already, you need to consider this going forward for an ordinance. And as always, engage public safety. If you have any issues, um, any questions about, hey, how should we address this? How should we, you know, we have this road name that's come in, you know, always loop in public safety on these decisions and these discussions. Um, so from the GIS perspective, you know, obviously you're going to need to compile the data. Okay, if you're not the addressing authority, you're going to need to be a part of that workflow um, that ensures the addresses get into the GIS. Okay, because ultimately your GIS is going to go forth and support these different enterprise business needs. Okay, so you need to ask the question, do I have addresses that are missing? Okay, um, you need to bring the stakeholders to the table and talk about workflows and ways to get the data included in your GIS. Um, talk about the placement method. How are you going to place your sub addresses? And obviously, you're going to need to think through ongoing maintenance and data quality issues. So like we have the screenshot here of a duplicate address point. So how are you going to identify those? How are you going to resolve those? Okay. From the public safety perspective, you do need to make sure that you're engaging your addressing authority anytime that you discover issues. Okay, this is the only way that um, that this is going to work in refining the data and ultimately improving your response um, to different incidents, okay? You want to also engage in that ordinance creation process um, and really be involved in kind of like the signage requirements. Um, your input would be very valuable because remember, just because somebody has their address painted on like a tiny little rock at the end of their driveway, somebody in a big fire truck, are y'all gonna be able to see that? If you have three rocks at the end of a driveway and it's like a really long rural driveway, you know, these are the kind of things that, that you want to be engaged in. I know it seems trivial, but it is kind of a big deal because this all goes um, into creating a standard, right? Um, and then, of course, you want to be engaged in that subdivision or plan review process, okay? So if people are proposing new road names, um, you know, you definitely want to be included in that process. So now, let me look at the questions. Yeah, or if the sign is buried in snow, that's coming. Um, apartment complexes, yeah, we're gonna talk about that too. Um, wow, you guys have some great input. I'm loving this. What time is it? Okay, so good, we still have time. Okay, so now we're gonna talk about address point placement, okay? Because from a GIS perspective, like you know, that's kind of like another part of it, right? So when you get your, when you get your subs, you know, from the addressing authority, now you have to get them into GIS and figure out how to manage them, okay? And we, we did talk before about this document. So this is the um, information document for the development of site structure address point GS data for 911. Now this is a shorter document, it's about 64, 65 pages, and there's a lot of content in here. But I want to draw your attention to the fact that it is an informational document. This is not a standard, okay? So this document is, it's about possibilities, okay? And I mentioned this to you in July that um, something is better than nothing, okay? And we don't want to let perfection be the enemy of the good, all right? So if all you're starting out with, if all you have are parcel centroids, then we're gonna rock with that and we're gonna start with that. And then you can, you can, as time goes on, refine that even further, okay? It's all gonna be based on your resources and what you can do, all right? But this is a great document to start off with. Um, I highly recommend it, highly, highly recommend it. And a lot of the content that I'm gonna show you is actually pulled from this document. So address points need to be placed to, <laughs> allow points to be located. I mean, you, you need to make sure that that it's accurately describing the location, okay? And the goal here is to get people to a location quickly and efficiently. That's the whole point. That's why I keep saying addressing is for public safety, okay? Um, I understand that right now, Amazon is like, and I'm speaking for myself, Amazon is like up there, okay? But, you know, if I were in an emergency, I would want like, my, my location to be up here for emergency response, but, you know, Amazon. Okay. So, you know, we talked about that in July as well about, you know, how we perceive addresses and how a lot of people think that addresses are a function of the post office and stuff because mail is like the most relevant thing to us in our daily lives. Okay. But ultimately it needs to, 
support our public safety. That's the whole point. So I don't remember if I showed you this in July, but um, we, we do talk about our data quality from uh, an accurate accuracy and precision standpoint. So if we're pretending like these light green boxes are our parcels and our red points are addresses, and then we have, um, you know, the white, you know, rectangles are um, structures, okay? Is it accurate to say that every parcel has an address point? Yes, because there is an address point on every single parcel, okay? It is accurate to say that. But precision would be ensuring that every address point is associated with a structure. Now, I understand that that might be difficult for a lot of you. And it's like we just talked about, you know, some of you have more resources than others. Some of you may have uh, building footprints. Some of you may have up-to-date aerial photography, okay? Some of you may not be ESRI clients and you may not have access to that base image. I get it, okay? So you have to go with what you have. So I don't want you to be discouraged by this conversation. This is all about possibilities, okay? Um, but this is this is like the best methodology for NG911 to associate an address point with the structure. Um, we did also talk about this idea of address points versus access points. Okay, so um, an address point represents like where the structure is located, but an access point actually represents how you actually access that property and where that access way is located. Okay, and this is really important for like long driveways, rural areas. We did talk about these different placement point methodologies or point placement methodologies. And I understand that I'm like going over the stuff that we went over a few months ago. I get it, okay? But you also have to understand that your sub addressing is only gonna be as good as your primary, okay? So that's why it's important to kind of rehash this. So we did talk about geocoding, um, parcel placement. Generally, it's the centroid, um, a site, just kind of like in the general area of a site um, right on top of the structure and also the property access, okay? And I don't know if you remember this slide, but this actually came from the NINA informational document, okay? So what are the best placement methods? Um, and one star is kind of like least desirable and three stars is kind of like, the, that's, that could be like the most desirable, okay? So for um, a lot of these public safety applications, geocoding is the least desirable. Um, parcel placement and site placement are mediocre. Um, property access is great for vehicle routing. That's why I highly recommend if you guys are in a rural area that you maintain two separate files. So maintain like your regular address points and then create a file for um, your access point, like how you actually get into that property, okay? And as you can see here, that structure placement is definitely the most desirable for most public safety applications. Obviously for vehicle routing, it's the least desirable because it really has more to do with like the physical location than it does routing um, a vehicle to that location. But that's why you can actually use both of those in tandem to really give your dispatchers and your first responders the most information and the best experience. All right. So sub addresses basically, you know, I think I think I went over some examples earlier that that makes sense. But within the data model, there are different ways of breaking these down. Okay, um, obviously they span across residential, commercial. They don't even have to apply to buildings. Okay, it can be like like I said, a park with ball fields. Um, but you can have a building, floor, unit, and we're going to go over this in more detail. Um, room and seat. Okay, and then there's additional location information, um, which gives you, which gives you basically an opportunity to include information that doesn't fit into any of those other attributes. Okay, now the data model allows for sub addressing down to the seat level. You as a locality need to figure out if that's something that you're willing to deal with, because that's a tremendous undertaking and you need to be consistent no matter what, no matter what you do, um, you need to be consistent. So if you are in a community where you have a lot of, um, you know, tall buildings that have multiple floors and it's really important for you to have 
um, everything mapped out to the seat, you know, that's something that, that you should do a strategic plan for, okay? Um, because that is a tremendous level of effort. And you know how people change, change cubes, they change offices, especially now with all the COVID stuff, like um, floor structures, floor plans are changing to allow for social distancing. There's like a lot that goes into this. Okay, but just be advised that you do have this ability to go down to the seat. Okay, um, I don't necessarily recommend this. I actually don't recommend this. Um, I feel like if you can get uh, the four and a unit number, that's awesome. And a lot of you, you know, it's gonna depend on the type of information that you're getting. If you're able to get those plans for those buildings and you know, like, you know, okay, I have three floors and each floor has eight apartments or whatever, then that's obviously gonna be a lot of information to include. You know, it's gonna help you pack the record. And, and that's a term that we use when we talk about giving our public safety people as much information as possible so that they can, they can pass that on to our first responders, okay? The more information, the better. So let's talk about sub-addressing by unit, okay? Um, this is an example of one building. And again, these screenshots came from that, that uh, NINA informational document. It's not a standard, it's an informational document. Okay, so there's multiple ways of doing things. So you can sub-address by the unit. Now, in this particular example, they are using alphas, okay? And the alpha situation is one that is, is still can be very perplexing. <laughs> when I was in local government, there was like a time period where the post office said, go away from alphas because everybody writes their letters differently, but numbers are fairly consistent in the United States. So go with those. Um, in this FINA example, we're using alphas, okay? So um, I would say that no matter what you do, just be consistent, okay? Um, and you can, as the addressing authority, say, no, we're gonna do units one through six. Like that's your prerogative as the addressing authority. You can say, you know, you can have a developer submit a plan and say, we're gonna go units, you know, A through F, and you can say, no, we're gonna go one through six. You can do that, okay, just so you know. Um, but basically what this does is it allows you to assign um, one address per, per unit, okay? And this applies, this, is, this is particular example is for a business, but this applies anywhere where you have multiple um, individual units or suites within a building. Okay, so it could be an apartment, it could be, um, you know, a doctor's office complex, anything like that. Um, you can also place these at an entrance and you can stack them if you want. Okay. Do I advocate for this? Not necessarily, just because, you know, I feel like you're, this is more valuable, right? Like being able to put the unit on every single space where it makes sense is valuable. But again, if you don't have the resources to do this, if all you were given is a sheet of paper that said 3421 Sheridan Drive, units A through F, then this might be more appropriate for you, okay? Again, it's about possibilities, okay? It's, it, this is not like hard and fast, like don't do this, do this. You know, it's allowing for possibilities. Okay, so stacking them at the entrance might be appropriate because like I said, this, this might be all the information that you have. Okay, so this is acceptable, all right? Okay, so sub-addressing by individual building. And I have a good friend on this um, webinar and we were just talking about this through email. We actually have talked about this a couple of times, I think. But basically, um, this is a mobile home park. Okay, and this is, now, when you're looking at this, I also want you to think about your local standards, your local ordinances, okay? Because in my county, I live in Virginia. In my county, we have a mix of mobile home parks that have sub addresses like this, but then we also have some where, kind of like after the standards were put in place, where everybody has to have an individual primary, okay? And for me, and again, this is just Annie, Data Mark Annie talking, I think from a public safety perspective, it makes more sense to have individually named roads and primaries assigned off of that. Because 
lot numbers can get confusing. Numbers can fall off if people don't maintain, they don't post them and there's no regulations for posting. Like, what do you do when numbers fall off the building? I mean, we have a lot of really, really old mobile home parks in my community, guys, and you can't, you can't tell what they are when you drive through. Like, you can't see any of the lot numbers. So I think from that perspective, it's a little bit more manageable to require road names up front um, and initiate that process, okay? Um, it is a little bit more work. But if this is like a planned community up front, or if you can work with, um, you know, the main office or, you know, whoever is managing the mobile home park, um, this is a good opportunity for, for you to implement that. But what I'm saying is, is that it is allowed. You can assign one, like in this case, it's 550 is the address. Um, and I don't know if it's 550 North 19th Street, and then all of the lots are assigned off of that. Um, I've also seen units, units and lots interchangeably um, for mobile home park. Okay. Again, this is about possibilities. Um, now I will say that Nina's recommendation, um, and again, it's not a standard. Okay. It's just more of like a best practice is if you have two or more structures that share right of way, then that structure or that right of way should be named, should be a named road. And then you can assign the primaries off of that. In my County, um, we had, it was like three or more if three or more structures shared a right of way, then we required a name for that right of way. And the structures were assigned addresses off of that right of way. It was a, it was a, a legitimate road. It was drawn in the GIS, it had a range. Um, and it was just like a regular road. Okay, let me pop up here. I see a Q and A. You see it, Amy? Yeah, I see it. So um, Joseph asks, can I get clarification regarding the, the one designated agent for addressing and how it relates to NG91 requirements? Well, the NG91 requirements are more pertaining to the GIS data, okay? There are no NG91 requirements about an addressing authority, um, but the addressing authority shapes what that data looks like and the whole workflow matters, Joseph. So when I go into a locality, um, I talk to everybody. I, I even talk to the municipalities um, because I want to know how that how that data moves through. I want to know how how the request comes in, what that whole process looks like, um, and I want to know how it gets communicated into GIS. What what is the turnaround time? How long does it take from the time a request is received to the time that the data is eventually provisioned into public safety systems? There's like a whole lot that goes into that. So while the um, one designated agent for addressing is, is not an NG91 requirement. I have seen what that can do within a municipality. And I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to be Miss Unpopular here because I, I do think that public safety really should assume addressing responsibilities because I don't think it's fair for our, for our friends and planning departments to be expected to know about public safety and all that that implies. Like that's not, that's not their training, right? But because NG911 is changing how we do business, um, it is a conversation that we have to have. You know, just because it's the way we've always done it, is it the way that we should continue doing things? So I don't know if that answered the question, but um, I, I'm, you know, we can definitely talk if you want to email. Um, so, Okay, so we did the, the, the mobile home park. Locations on a site. So yeah, like if you have a park with ball fields and, and different buildings, you know, this could definitely qualify for sub addressing. My park actually has um, named streets and um, I believe the, um, the addresses there are assigned off of those streets. There is kind of like one weird example in there um, that I think is gonna cause a problem in the future, but um, I'm not there anymore, so. But yeah, these are just different ways of doing things, different possibilities, okay? Um, so here's things to avoid if possible, all right? Now don't come for me because again, this is about possibilities and kind of like good, better, best, okay? So we wanna avoid one address point for multiple structures because obviously this can cause a problem. If somebody calls and says, I'm at 100 Conifer Circle, Imagine there's an emergency out there, there's no signage. You may end up in a situation where you're driving from building to building. 
and, and it happens. It's a very real thing, okay? Now, the example on the right is the address of 100 for all four buildings, okay? So you've done a good job by associating a point with a structure, but you have to get more granular with it. You're gonna to have to give individual building numbers at that point, or you're gonna to have to just assign a primary. But if you leave it at 100 conifer circle for all four of those, that's gonna result in duplicate address points, which is a big deal. Every address in your GIS should be unique, okay? And you use sub addressing to make your addresses unique. This is kind of a similar example. Um, you know, this is not as serious because these all look like they're kind of part of the same business. So if you called and said, well, you know, I have an emergency in the office, then, you know, maybe they would know where to go or if you said I'm in the garage or whatever. Um, but still, you know, you, you want to try to be more specific. Okay. And you, you, you want to avoid, you know, duplicating those numbers without giving any unique identifying information. Just like what we talked about with a mobile home park, um, you know, the entire thing address is 2032. That's not, that's, that's unacceptable. Um, you, you need to make sure that you're providing, again, some unique information. Um, and, you know, over here, I don't know, again, you know, we're, we're trying to support our first responders. Okay. So give as much information as you can to make every structure unique. If you can, if you have the resources. Similarly, with an apartment complex, same situation. Looks like they've got road names in here. So I would give each of these a primary. The same, the same with this mobile home park, all right? Each of these, I mean, it looks like they've got streets in through here. So give them primaries off of those streets, not a problem. Um, business park, same situation, okay? Um, this is a lot of structures here. So you could request or require a road name if there's some access way. Um, you know, here you could require a separate road name, or if you had the available addressing and you wanted to make an exception, then you could assign them off of this Washington Avenue, whatever makes sense. Okay. But the more unique the information, the more valuable it's going to be. Um, college campus, same thing. You want to avoid this. If you're going to go this route and you're going to call everybody 1400, then you'd better assign subs that make sense. Okay, so that also includes, you know, maybe giving um, building names. That includes, um, you know, maybe giving floors, especially for um, like your dorm buildings. If if you have dorms that have multiple floors, this is a good opportunity to do that as well. So when it comes to attribution, um, you definitely want to consult. I'm checking the time, guys. Sorry. You definitely want to consult the GIS data model. Um, because from a GIS perspective, this is going to give you all of the fields that are required for your road center lines, your address points, and all of the emergency call routing um, boundary information. Okay, so um, we have the address number prefix, the number, and the suffix. Those are the most important. Um, and this is how they would break down within the CLDXF. Now, the CLDXF is a civic location data exchange format document, and the data model is kind of like the easier front end to that. But if you if you have some weird sub addresses, like I told you, we have half in, in my community, this is giving you specific examples of how these things could be written. So you may have a prefix, like we, we see a lot of data that's got alphas in front of the actual address number. And it gives you examples of how to lay that out and what would be appropriate to put in these different fields. Okay, so there's a lot of really good information in the CLDXF. Um, so we do have some additional sub addressing elements here in the data model. Um, and I kind of explained this to you guys a little bit earlier that it, it's allowed down to the seat level, but then you also have the ability to include um, additional location information. So you could you could write in that it's a loading dock area, for example. Um, you also have the ability to include a placement type, which is a domain value um, that can be updated. And there's information in the in the standard about how to update that. And then of course your placement method. So if you have a question about what placement method was used, then you can include that as well. Now all of the sub addressing fields are optional. Okay, which means that it's optional. Optional means you don't have to have them. But because addressing is for public safety, 
you want to provide as much information in there as you possibly can. And then again, just how to break out those sub address um, data elements. So this is if you were using um, building, and then if you had any additional location information, um, how you would enter that in. And then of course, what that would actually look like in the data model. Okay, lots of really good information in the CLDXF. It's very dry, it's very boring, but it's a very good if you have a lot of these very unique situations. Okay. So special considerations, you want to balance the level of detail with the address and application. Okay, don't stress yourself out about addressing to the seat level because it's really not necessary. Um, you know, you can always set goals and work toward those goals. Okay, um, you know, you could consider a related table for stacked points um, or you could distribute them across the property. I mean, however you want to do it, um, is totally up to you. There's lots of different ways to do this. That remember, sub addressing and these different documents that we talk about are about possibilities. Okay. Um, so, what are our next steps? Hang on till the end, guys, because I have another like little quiz and you're going to love it. I promise. Um, review your ordinances. Make sure they support addressing for public safety. Okay. Go through, find them, Indiana Jones, find those papyrus ordinances. Um, and if you can't, then come up with some new ones. Bring all the people together. Um, and if you if you need to call on help, we're here. That's that's what we're here for. Okay. You want to make sure that you define your addressing authority. Lay out your process for assigning an address. Um, lay out that road naming process, and then of course your signage is really really important. Um, assess your resources. You know, do you have the resources available to manage sub addressing? Um, you, you understand that it is a certain level of effort. So um, how are you going to manage those resources? Gather information from other agencies. Okay. And then you might have to ask a really hard question. Should my addressing authority change? I have recommended it in very few circumstances when I've seen things that are just really bad. Um, and where things are not being done appropriately. I sometimes do suggest that the addressing authority change for the better of the, of the county. Um, we already talked about how NG911 expands our list of stakeholders. So we're going above and beyond public safety people and expanding it to other agencies as well. And then of course, a lot of this involves education. <laughs> so like if you have people in planning who are not doing what they're supposed to be doing, I don't know why I always pick on planning guys, right? Planning people, I'm sorry, I love you. It's just an example. Um, but if you have public works, you have people in public works who don't know how to assign addresses based on public safety best practices, then you need to educate them, okay, or make a bigger decision to change the addressing authority. Um, communication, super important. Um, and then you may consider a work group for your NG91 stakeholders. That's also very valuable. Prioritize your problem areas. Talk to your public safety. Again, engage the stakeholders, find out where you're really struggling and prioritize those sensitive populations. Um, there are different tools out there for sub address management. The first are, are the NINA documents that we've already discussed, right? The Civic Location Data Exchange Format, that's a standard. The GS data model is a standard. The Development of Site Structure Address Points is an informational document with a lot of really good guidelines. Um, we do have an ACE process, a data mark, and that can help you identify sub addresses. If you have no sub addresses, or if you think that you're missing a lot of them, this can be a very valuable tool for you to collect that information. It can um, accept spatial data sets or tabular data sets. And what we do is we run a comparison on our end and we generate a list of potentially missing address points. Okay, and, and they have confidence scores associated with them, but it's a really valuable process to help you identify any missing addresses, okay, especially sub addresses. Um, strategic planning, shameless plug for me, but this is also really valuable for identifying areas in your addressing workflow where you could improve um, in the overall workflow, but especially with, with sub addresses. Um, also, let me ask this question. How would your workflows be improved by an addressing tool, a simplified addressing tool, like an addressing portal that would help you manage it, that would go beyond you know, your normal Esri software? Is that something you guys would be interested in? Yeah, okay. Yeah, so um, 
you know, keep your keep connected to Datamark because that's something that we are working on um, for our clients. We we hear what you're saying and we hear that addressing management is an issue. Okay, so this is a very important thing that we're working on um, as a separate portal to assist with people managing their addresses. Okay, um, wait a minute. Now, I would ask you if there's any questions, but I know we have like a bajillion questions in the chat. So I have a question for you. Number one, did you enjoy this webinar? Was it valuable to you? Um, let me see your answers. I know we're like two minutes over. Okay. All right, I just was hoping that I was not repeating things or being super boring. Um, so I have a question for you guys because it is kind of spooky season, okay? Like I said, and I wanted to show you guys this. So this next picture is of a very famous house that's featured in maybe a movie or two. Whose house is that? I took this picture. Whose is it? The first person to guess correctly, you're gonna get something sweet for me. Wait. <laughs> Cliff, Autumn, Autumn. Okay. So incidentally, this is, um, it's actually Nancy's house from Nightmare on Elm Street. So um, in the first movie, the door was actually blue. Incidentally, Nightmare on Elm Street was Johnny Depp's first movie, by the way. Um, so this is the Nightmare on Elm Street house. It's in Hollywood. I was in LA a few weeks ago and I prioritized this visit. Um, I really wanted to see this, but yeah, it's a normal house on a normal street. It's not Elm Street, it's actually Genesee Trail, um, but the number is still the same. So it's 1428 Genesee. Anyway, um, Thank you guys so much. I hope this has been informative for you. Um, I really appreciate you. I appreciate your time today. And um, I'm here for you. Just email me, call me anytime you need anything. Okay. Bye.